Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Knit a Spell. Woo. Today, we have an amazing guest, Katie. It's Nicholas Pearson, the Woo-hoo. crystal expert, Reiki teacher, and author of seven books, including Crystal Basics. Hi, Nicholas. Welcome to Knit a Spell. Thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to join you today. Light from Lantern presents Knit a Spell. I'm magical maker, Katie Rempe. And I'm the maker of magic, James Devine. Join us as we stitch together the symbiotic relationship between crafting and the craft. I am ecstatic that you're able to be here. We're inspired to ask you to be on the show because as Katie and I were putting this episode together, the episode is about crystals of protection. And we started looking at, okay, well, what are the crystals that are used for protection? And as we started looking up crystals, it seems like, A, there's differing opinions on the internet. B, there's differing opinions in books. C, Seems like almost every crystal can be used for almost anything. D, ah! But then I remembered in my fabulous Instagram series, Meet a Mystic, I had such a great time with you, Nicholas, because your approach is so much about the science, like your understanding of mineralogy, gemology, like the the chemical makeup, the crystalline makeup of the minerals is so fascinating to me. Added to your knowledge of the metaphysical side, how the metaphysics work, how the magic works. And you have such an elegant way of bringing those two things together that I was immediately drawn to, Katie, let's just see on a whim if Nicholas is available and talk to him about this topic. So that's where this came from. And I'm curious, how did your passion for crystal start? Well, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, my, my love for rocks began early in life just because I was that kid who picked up rocks everywhere. Um, it didn't matter where I was. If, if rocks spoke to me, it came home with me. And so it was kind of like the, the regular habit of having to empty my pockets before they went in the laundry, which continues to this day. My very soon to be husband still has to check my pockets for rocks. Um, but right around the right, right old age of eight, my grandfather gave me my first quartz crystal. So rock was suddenly transfigured from this kind of inert part of the landscape that I liked, but other people didn't quite get to something that clearly was magical. And it's kind of a big claim to say that one rock changed my life, but in no uncertain terms is that true. That is exactly what happened. This one mineral specimen from Hot Springs, Arkansas would alter the trajectory of many, many years to come. So I'm still a collector. I still have that same piece of quartz right beside me. I was teaching a class just on quartz today. So that was kind of my, my totemic ally, if you will, to hold through the the, the six weeks we just closed today. And um, early on, you know, I grew up in a non-religious household. My dad was a recovering Catholic. He had a science background. So I was encouraged to have a science background or foreground, I guess, at that point as well. And when other families went to church on weekends, we went to what I lovingly refer to as the Cathedral of Learning. We went to the library every two weeks, except for when I was too smart for my own good. And then we had to go every week because my dad convinced me I was only allowed to check out four books at a time. I I genuinely thought this was a rule in libraries. Um, And then I started to read four books a week or more. So um, you know, I wow. got bigger books or more of them and, and that made everyone happy. But one week it might be the natural sciences and learning about the earth and learning about, you know, plants or fish or whatever I could sink my teeth into. And then the next week it might be fairy tales and folklore and world religion and mythology. Cause there's this vacancy in my life. Other kids talked about church and Jesus and the Bible. I have no idea to this day what most of that is really about. You know, I've done some reading. It's not for me. It was so interesting to me how all over the world uh, you have these kind of parallel symbol sets that describe the same natural phenomena and derive meaning from it in startlingly similar ways. So whether, you know, we bow at the church of science or Scientology, I mean, really human beings are trying to derive meaning in the world around us. And the special place where I found the overlap between science and spirituality was in crystal healing, which opened the door to learning about the folklore of rocks and their magical uses. And that, you know, led me down the witchcraft wormhole. So, you know, I'm very glad it did. 
occultism fits me pretty well, I think. And rocks continue to be the thing that I think I get the most excited about every day. Oh, I love it. We were talking in another episode about how it's one thing to, yeah, you can buy like a crystal quartz or an emerald or whatever, but there's just as many powerful qualities in the rocks that are right by you. Yeah, and that's that's a very, 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 very old practice. Mm-hmm. Working with what's at your doorstep, what's in your backyard, what's below your feet. Um, I, I wear some pretty humble things every day. I have a bracelet made out of granite. It's granite from a particularly cool place for me, but like the fact that it's granite is not geologically very interesting. The average crystal healer looks at granite and sneers. Um, but those are the kind of rocks that I really find myself turning to a lot more these days. I still have a fabulous mineral collection. I still spend a lot of money on the, like museum quality rocks, but sometimes it's the simple things, limestone, flint, chalk, um, that really support us the most when we need it. Oh, chalk. I didn't even think about that, but of course, yes. I have a, a rock and a shell that I found on the beach that actually fit together, almost like they're made for each other and are a symbol of the two polarities of deity. And they were found in different spots in the same beach. Absolutely the coolest thing ever. And when I was a kid in the Sonoran desert, I would find turquoise just laying there in the desert as I walked. And that was always really fun to find and sort of collect. It's really special to find those things around your own doorstep. Nicholas, let me ask you this. Do you think that's part of the reason why stones and crystals are so often used for protective qualities is because they're kind of like everywhere? Yes and no. I mean, they're kind of like the mystical other, aren't they? Like Hmm. they're part of the landscape. They're accessible. They're available. They're also separate from us in some ways. They're utilitarian, you know, our our earliest shelters, our earliest tools, some of our first pigments, and so on and so forth. We continue to use rocks, minerals, ores, um, and and synthesized versions thereof in our technology to this day. But, you know, think of the, the sureness you feel enclosed in a stone circle or the the concrete walls of your home, which is made of pulverized rocks. Think of the protection that something sharp like a rough piece of obsidian or flint or anything else might confer to you if you are walking through the wilds with no light think of how supported we are by rock in every single thing that we do it's it's this pervasive way that it touches our existence and has since the beginning of time and i think the reason in particular so many fancy rocks, gems, and minerals tend to be associated with protection when we look at the the folklore, both modern and not so modern, is because of that that otherness, that sacredness. There are lots of indigenous ideas from many parts of the world that tell us that at least certain minerals, certain gems, are somehow wrapped up in some sort of divine providence. And so when we hold a piece of something like quartz that the gods have permanently transfigured or something like lapis lazuli, which resembles the night sky or a piece of obsidian, which comes from this liminal space and erupts from the earth, we're holding something beyond the ordinary. And to have that non-ordinariness around us elevates us above and beyond the things that might threaten our existence, reminds us of something eternal. And the fact that rock is part of the landscape for ever, that, that eternity, that way that it, it stands, the erosive nature of time itself confers some of that ability to withstand the stuff that wants to erode us and erode our peace the same way. It's so well said. I guess I think about our squishy flesh versus like the durability of rock and how it just sustains. And there's that contrast. What are the crystals that people turn to for protection? I could think of a few myself, but I'd like to ask your opinion. <laughs> well, if I wanted to list as many as I could think of, we'd be here all night. So yeah, I'm right. I mean, I don't want to wear us out. But <clears throat> and that's why say, we needed an expert. It was like, well, if it's black, it seems to be a theme. That's fairly yeah. unsatisfying. Yeah, I guess like, a better yeah. this that maybe Katie, you you bring up a better question, which is how would one discern protective qualities in a crystal and stone? My thought was, gosh, you know, I'd turn to color, weight, 
and how it feels in my hand. Well, I mean, color is meaningful to a lot of people. The the interpretation of color in the world around us is a very human thing, but our relationship with color changes culturally over time. So the meaning we attribute to colored gems also changes over time. So these days you find a lot of things that are uh, protective that are maybe black or metallic. And, you know, we think of those things as kind of deflecting um, energy. If if we look at the physics of their color, they're actually absorbing the whole spectrum. They're not reflecting much of anything at all. So that that kind of doesn't oh. track. Um, <clears throat> if we look at like the contrast between white and black versus, you know, today versus the, you know, Mesolithic or Neolithic era, they had them flipped. You know, white was not a very positive color because it was the color of the barren land, of snow, of bone, and black was the color of fertile earth. So we have to remember that that color is a moving target. And I also have to admit, I have a personal bias here. I'm really profoundly colorblind. So color is the least important thing in mineral ID. It's it's the last thing a geologist is going to use to assess what species something is. It can be helpful. Um, and sometimes uh, the shade of something is so telltale, you don't have to go through the rest of this stuff. But, you know, someone scientifically minded is going to go through the rest of the stuff anyway, just to be sure. If you look at the physics behind that, color is maybe 7% of a crystal's total energy. It's a very small amount. If we look at how the the process involved, the ingredients that come together, or its chemical composition, its crystal structure, then we get some really concrete clues. And then we can also maybe look to the historical record. So um, you find a lot of minerals that are rich in iron that are really protective, or even those that just have enough iron to alter their color. So, you know, we could be talking about carnelian, which is attributed to Mars. <clears throat> Long before people knew it had iron in it, iron being the planetary metal associated with our Mars. And Mars is the planet we think of as like God of war, God of defense, ambition, drive, motivation, conflict, all of those kinds of things. So um, a Martian kind of gem would be good for. Bloodstone, a variety of Jasper, same idea. It's got these little red flecks in it from little traces of hematite. Hematite itself is uh, a very simple iron oxide. So that could be a great protection kind of stone. And if we want to like carry that iron continuity just one further, we could maybe even look at black tourmaline. So a lot of people are going to look at the color black and go, yeah, this is protective. But black tourmaline is one of the most iron rich members of the tourmaline group. Tourmaline's not one kind of rock. It's actually like a bunch of cousins that are closely related, but not exactly the same. So uh, that would be like the iron bearing member of that group. And some of the other stones that I like to use for protection are, are things that have maybe some interesting optical phenomena that give us clues as to how they might interact with um, say capital L light because of how they interact with lowercase L light, if that makes sense. So yes. something like Labradorite, Labradorite has this effect kind of like diffusion um, diffraction grading rather. So as, as light penetrates, it kind of gets scrambled and then it's, we see beautiful Isn't colors. it called labradorescence? <laughs> Don't they yeah. call it that? Yeah. Labradorescence oh. is, is that phenomenon exhibited in this stone from its unique makeup. Right. So we would, we would call it like a, <laughs> like a, um, it's that luminous quality that labradorite has that we would maybe call uh, iridescence, but it actually, I think it's really cool that it actually has a name in labradorite called labradorescence. Is it Labradorescence, is that right? Yeah, labradorescence. Yes. So yeah. very isn't that a cool geek your geek out moment brought to you by oh Nicholas Pearson. Yes. <laughs> so, and, and what's nifty versus um iridescence, which is like a superficial thing, labradorescence occurs because of something called an immiscibility gap. So feldspar is a big family. It includes labradorite and moonstone and sunstone and lots of other things. But here's something that might blow our minds a bit. Um, like sunstone and moonstone are phenomena. They're not substances. So any number of substances, when they demonstrate those optical phenomena can be called those things. So with, with the property of labradorescence, it's typically found in labradorite, but it can also be found in, in other things that do the same thing. So we have like these layers, we call them laminae from like the Latin word to laminate, to bond together yeah. Yeah. and they, they intermingle. And depending on the, the um, relative width of those individual layers, they will bend light in slightly different directions because they have different refractive indices. So um, the, the width of it will be related to the wavelength of light that we perceive. So, you know, if it's much wider, we're going to see red. If it's much narrower, we're going to see like blue and violet. So the thinner the layers, the, the, the shorter the wavelength of light gets through to our eyes. That's how we perceive it. Even though none of those pigments are in the stone. There's, there's no chemical in there that changes the color. It's, it's all like a trick of the light, but it's, it's the fact that it deals with boundaries. It is the boundary between these two closely related things that are not the same. And so in our own energy field, it does something kind of similar. It reminds my, my aura where its boundaries begin and end. So that way I'm not taking on other people's 
crud, uh, to use a technical term. Um, <laughs> and even Unlike though my all the rest energy, of the terms we yeah, right. yeah. using, <laughs> even even though my energy field resembles someone else's quite a lot, they're they're distinct, they're separate, and so labradorite allows that boundary to be there, kind of like a selectively permeable membrane. There are some things that can come and go, certain wavelengths that pass with ease, and others get kind of scrambled and filtered out. And that is helpful because boundaries allow us to remain whole. Boundaries allow us to um, express unconditional love without having to sacrifice ourselves because that doesn't mean we have to have unconditional relationships. If, if we have these unconditional relationships, we can't practice self-care. And, you know, at the end of the day, self-care is community care. So Labrador, it's a really great stone. If we tend to show up better for other people than we show up for ourselves, it's just, just enough of a reminder to say, Hey, um, have you taken a step back yet today? Um, this, this burden you're carrying, I don't think that came from you. Would, would you like to put it down? Okay, let's do that. Okay, do you see why I insisted on Nicholas Pierce being interviewed? Do you oh see what gosh. I mean now? Can we get this to be like a quarterly segment? I just, <laughs> you have so much knowledge. I just want to listen to all of the things. I have so many questions. I'm made of questions now. Speaking of the lamination and how that changes the light, how does the natural shape of a stone or gem influence the energy versus something that we, the people, then put it into afterwards? Do you, and do you mean the cut shape that it's polished into, or do you mean the crystalline structure that it forms in? Like the natural, we would just get it from the earth and then here you go versus like, okay, I'm going to make this into like a, a pyramid or something like that. Sure. Yeah. yeah I have thoughts. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the three fundamental drivers in a crystal's energy, like the fundamental, we'll use an analogy of music. The things that determine what pitch we hear are its composition. What, what ingredients came together, the shape they formed its crystal structure and the process that brought them together. Everything else is kind of secondary to that. So that's going to include like whether light passes all the way through or not the color, the hardness, specific gravity. I mean, you name it, if it's something we can measure, it's somehow affecting the energy, but you notice like shape external morphology is, is not in that list of primary things. So that's because in, in nature, in the geosphere, as things form on their own, um, the external forms are going to be a reflection of two primary things, the internal laws of symmetry you know, what, what primary shapes do its molecules make? And also what's available in its environment. So relative speed and pressure and temperature and how much room there is that, that determines a lot. So if those are our primary drivers, then no amount of cutting, grinding, scraping, faceting, polishing changes those. So we're not changing the fundamental pitch that we're hearing, but we can affect the way the energy is distributed, which is kind of like listening to the same song on two different sets of speakers. How it sounds with your earbuds in probably sounds a little bit different than it does from tinny version of that file played on YouTube on your desktop. So same yeah. music, but how we perceive it differs on shape. So we can maybe encourage it to be more evenly distributed with something like a sphere, something soft and kind of radiant in all directions. We can encourage it to be really directional if it has a point on it. Um, but all of that still is, is subsidiary to those primary laws of how it's formed, what ingredients it's made out of, and what shape those ingredients make. I love that there's a logic to this also. I sometimes have judgment around stones that are cut or polished. I just really love stones that are natural. I'm always in search of a really well-formed garnet that is a natural crystal garnet. Obviously, that to find one that has any kind of translucency that is in its natural form is probably hella expensive in a, in a museum somewhere. But an unpolished crystal garnet, I don't think it's a dodecahedron, but whatever the shape, is it a dodecahedron? Is that the, yeah, I only, only know that because of Dungeons and Dragons. But in any case, it's a really cool distinctive shape that is the natural crystalline structure of a garnet. And you'll see them sometimes at crystal shows or whatever, and it's very hard to find them with any kind of translucency, but they're just amazing. What you've said, Nicholas, has me be less judgy about a stone being polished, cut, or made into a cabochon or something like that. Well, and you know, at the end of the day, you like what you like. So use the tools that resonate with you. That's that's a like pretty broad statement, not just about rocks, but in general. You know, right. like if you absolutely hate the color purple, you're probably not going to crochet a purple scarf. Unless someone asks you really hard. I don't think that having that kind of internal bias is 
it's it's neither productive nor destructive as as long as you still are in relationship with your rocks. Um, one thing I, I omitted that might be kind of a helpful point is that like shape also confers symbolic meaning. So even if it's not changing the fundamental energy of a crystal, it can affect our relationship. So you know the the shape of a heart has no particular resonance with the laws of physics that tells me it must vibrate to a frequency that equals unconditional love. But we have this kind of cultural phenomena built up around hearts. So when I buy a gem in a heart shape, I'm conferring another layer of meaning that comes from relationship. Um, and so, you know, we can have layers of meaning around natural shapes, artificial shapes, and everything kind of in between too. Why don't we take a quick break? And then when we come back, we'll dive into a little more magic and making aspects of crystals of protection. We'll be right back. Have you ever wanted to be a professional palm reader or add palm reading to your existing practice? Coming this summer, I will be taking applications for my six-month online group apprenticeship program, the Divine Hand Mastership Program. I will have a limited number of individuals that will have the opportunity to study the Divine Hand Method of Palmistry with me. You can sign up to learn more about this exclusive opportunity at thedivinehand.com forward slash mastership. Exciting news, listeners. Knit a Spell is coming to Patreon this summer. <laughs> Our fan club will help you gain access to advance notice to our monthly topics and guests. Episode outtakes. Voter power for future guests and episode topics. Private community to connect with other fans. That's my favorite. Exclusive giveaways and promotions. And coming soon, we will be adding a special segment to Knit a Spell, which will be a Q&A segment with your questions. Patreon members will be exclusively answered for their questions. So we hope you'll join us. Join us. And you'll be doing this all while supporting one of your favorite podcasts. Wrapped up in our gratitude. To learn more, sign up for our newsletter at knitaspell.com. And we're back. So, Nicholas, I'm curious what stones you go to for protection. And how do you use them? Like we talked yes. about, like, what do you use? But how also? One of my everyday stones is Labradorite, like we were talking about earlier, because it's a good, like, being able to show up for others, but also not take their crud home with you kind of thing. So I'm not building a wall. I don't want to do that. That doesn't yeah. make my work effective. Okay. I want to pause there because that is like the number one thing for everyone listening to take away is people forever are asking if you're an empath, how do I not take people's stuff on? This is such a pro tip right now. Mm -hmm. Labradorite. Mm -hmm. So thank you for letting me pause you right there because I just wanted to put a pin in that. So, okay. And then how would we use it? So one of my favorite ways is fairly passive. I wear a bracelet of it. You could stick some in a pocket, a bag, a bra, anything that works for you, wear it as a pendant, string of beads, make yourself happy with some Labradorite in your space. But I have a visualization that I use to accompany it. And I, I imagine that whatever my Labradorite token is. So if that's my bracelet, great. If it's you know something around your neck, hold that. And as you breathe, imagine that you're kind of drawing in the energy of Labradorite. Imagine it that it is you know, labradorescent or iridescent, just like the stone. And as you exhale, let it kind of fill your aura, let it become a kind of membrane of light around you, something flexible, something breathable. But the more you practice this, the more you crystallize that visualization, the easier it is to go to. And it becomes this almost like autonomic response. So your aura is like, oh, we got this. We know how to put this protection in place. And um, you will sometimes catch me in public talking to someone who is well-intentioned, but, you know, I can, I can feel their little etheric hands reaching out doing the whole grabby grabby. And I'm just like, Hmm, you know, I'd be happy to serve you. Here's my card. You can, you know, message me. And I put that boundary there, you know, and this is not the appropriate format for this, or, you know, that's not a thing that I do, but I can tell you who does. And, you know, Labrador, it's the way to have the energetic component of that. I have to like deal with the interaction, the social bit, the intellectual bit on mail. Labradorite won't give me that, but you know, if you operate in the public space for long enough, you you figure it out or you don't. So I'm I'm glad to be figuring it out. Another one that I use a lot is Priscelli Bluestone. So I do know that one's going to be a little less accessible to some people. It's found in Wales. Um, if we were geologists, we might call it 
um, ophitic dolerite. So dolerite is a kind of igneous rock and ophites are just like splotches, essentially. They're like phenocrysts or, or um, aggregates of specific mineral crystals inside the structure. So, you know, I've got a pendant here so you can see the little ophites, the, the little white patches against the kind of gray green, blue gray green kind of background or so I'm told. <clears throat> And this is what the inner ring of Stonehenge is made out of. There are lots of other stone circles and stone monuments, um, cairns and all sorts of fun things made from it. And it has this really deep resonance to the land. It strengthens us from the inside out. So rather than trying to build a boundary from the outside in, it helps us find the sense of resiliency. And it does that in part through staying really effectively grounded, I think. I think there are a lot of people who may not necessarily know what effective grounding looks like, feels like, and what it aims to accomplish. So, you know, when we are really fully grounded, we are completing the circuit between us and the earth, or even more effectively between the heavens and us and the earth. So yeah. we become a, a conduit. Things can flow through us, but they don't have to stick around. Um, you know, when we have a big appliance and we plug it into the wall here in the US, at least, we have that third prong, which is the grounding prong. So if there's a short, there's a safe place for it to discharge, it doesn't, you know, damage our appliance. And um, when we are effectively grounded, it's another way we can show up for people and not not hold their stuff, um, maybe even help them alleviate it because we have this strong rooting, a strong connection, a safe place to discharge anything that doesn't serve us, that is disharmonious, that is better served by being transmuted by the earth. So a good grounding stone is often a good protection stone, which is why we see things like black tourmaline and flint and even fluorite and granite, which are which are strong grounding stones also being effective for protection. Totally makes sense. We have a system in our tradition called anchoring. The reason we call it that is to dis- make a distinction between what most people do and call grounding, which is a way to anchor ourselves in the earth and up in the center of the universe. And it creates a durable state of groundedness, if you will. And we use crystals. Often we can do that with an edifice, like a home or a property. And we will sometimes bury or place grounding or protective crystals almost like wards in the corners of the property or in the corners of a room or a space or a building in order to sort of symbolically maintain that anchoring that's there, either pyramids of any kind of grounding or anchoring stone or protective stone. So we have used, I think I've used obsidian before because I've always thought of that, but I love this idea of an iron rich, even of uh, labradorite. And it's also convenient because black tourmaline tends to be less expensive than some of those other stones as well. For sure. Yeah. I'm all about making this accessible. It's, it's great if you can afford museum quality rocks. It's also okay if all you can do is like dig in your backyard and find some granite like that's a powerhouse of a protection stone so use the tools you got yeah Mm -hmm. and i i mean i know this is like kind of a bit of a tangent but i can't help to think that both of these stones especially something that's iron rich and especially something that helps you from taking on other people's shit this is a woman's stone this would be (laughs) such a great thing to have to help you again reassess like oh am i falling back into old habits and again having that iron rich we're, we're like all blood yeah, for sure. And there's there's a lot of interesting kind of parallels between gems and the divine feminine and things that I think are kind of new discoveries that herald the the hope, the intention, the 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 trajectory that we might be on to kind of reconcile the disparity between um, you know, femme bodied, femme identified people and and not femme identified people. So um, rainbow moonstone is actually a variety of the same mineral as labradorite and has this really profound connection to that goddess energy that you could certainly channel and still get the same labradorescence, the same kind of optical and therefore metaphysical effects from it. So that could be a really good option. Just from what I get from our conversation so far, you might also really jive with red coral. So red coral in some systems of astrology is associated with Mars, in particular Jatish or like Ayurvedic astrology. Mm -hmm. But um, it has this mythic story about its origins in uh, the Mediterranean, where it's, it's said to have been created by the blood of Medusa. And, you know, she was literally the most persecuted woman in Greek mythology. She just wanted to get away from men. And even got to the point she could turn them into rocks. Like, what a great talent. And still, a man comes and spoils her piece. So, um, typical. 
right? What kind of crafts are you into? I mean, obviously rocks, uh, clearly, but like, what else? How might you be incorporating them? Oh, so I, in my college days, I was a really big beater um, mm. and also a crocheter. I was never a very good crocheter, but I was a very fast crocheter. Like yeah. you could blink and I had a scarf done. It was wonky, but, but I could, I could just do it like, <laughs> like that. Uh, um, yeah. But my, my great love was like bead weaving. So um, like mm. three dimensional kinds of things with the little tiny delicacy beads, you know, you put 16 hours into a project and it is this long and it can't quite fit around your neck yet. And I would just keep going. And it's like a, a trance that I could just get into. And some of that stuff, I put gemstones in and some of it I wouldn't, but um, yeah, I, I really used to love that. And these days I don't have as much time for crafting, um, but I, I have maintained my collection of beads for mm, two decades now. So you know, they're still with me, kind it, of. It I've, comes back. Yeah, I've given some away, but, um, you know, there's the hope that maybe one day I'm going to sit down and go, you know, I can put 36 hours into a, like a choker length necklace. That's fine. I have nothing better to do. Hand nodding beads has been my hobby for a little while because it is so meditative and definitely goes a lot faster than seed beads like you're doing. And it's very meditative to do 108, like to make malas like this and hand knot every one. And it is very challenging for me to have focus like that. So this is about as long as I can handle having focus. But Katie is a very fast knitter. Her fingers fly as she knits. That's right. In I a could blur. ignite the needles at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> Fire starter. Yeah, that's right. So because crystals, not all crystals and stones are necessarily water safe, but one thing that um, probably, you know, as a crocheter and knitters and weavers and other people that are in the fiber arts do quite often is block projects at the end, submerge it into water, get all the stitches relaxed and do the finishing process. It'd be a great idea to add crystals right into the water. What are some water safe options that you might suggest? Oh, yeah. So my general rules of thumb would be to look for things with a hardness of above five. I mean, you can do lower than that if you really know your chemistry, um, but let's not take chances. Anything in the quartz family, quartz, clear, smoky, amethyst, citrine, but also like the cryptocrystalline quartzes, agate and chalcedony and carnelian and jasper, they, they'd all be great um, options. Um, your more durable gems, even if they're not like super precious versions like ruby, sapphire, emerald, aquamarine, topaz, they're going to be safe in water. Um, but look, look for things that, that are relatively durable. So they've got a hardness that can handle being crafty. You know, if you hit it with a, a needle or a crochet hook, you don't want to split it. So, you know, be mindful of that and, and avoid things that are really porous. And also it stands to reason, you know, if you're in the fiber arts, also avoid things that have been dyed because if, when you get it wet, yes, you know, bad things happen. That is a great point. Even your yarn has a tendency mm. to lose color. So that is a great point. Right. And I mean, if you pick some beautiful like dyed agate beads to add to a shawl or a scarf or anything else, and then you want to block it at the end, it might be possible that if the color of those beads is contrasting the color of the yarn, well, now your yarn is a different color. So... <clears throat> Ooh, which, you know, if you're doing that intentionally, could be quite cool and alchemical. Yeah, a lot of those stone beads, you forget that they're dyed. If you're buying them off Amazon or something, they're not always labeled. Well, this has been amazing. I want to make sure that before we go, you have plenty of time to tell everyone where they can reach you, social media, any upcoming events. People want to learn more about crystals. What are the things that you have out there? So I do a lot of different kinds of classes. Um, I have an ongoing series that I call my, my mineral master classes or my mineral monoliths. It's kind of a pun because it's about one rock monolith, but also oh, like, I get it. A monolith is something that stands by itself. It stands up, you know, it's, it's a, something that commands your attention. So like when you really get to know one rock, you recognize that it does a whole lot more than just a few prescriptive lines from your average crystal Bible or encyclopedia. Like it, there is so much more, they're multidimensional, just like we are. So I do those almost every month and every now and then I take a month off and I have replays of those on my Patreon with a bunch of other classes, but then I have, you know, great venues from all over the world who host me for different kinds of events. So, um, um, I've got a partnership with the College of Psychic Studies in London, and we try to get at least a few events every quarter. 
Um, so I've got some new stuff coming up with them and um, I've got some venues here in the States that also host me. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the return of in-person events later this year. So all of that stuff, you'll be able to find it um, in my social media. You can visit my link tree as well, which is plastered all across these places and it's available on my website. And although I don't have like a certification course myself, cause I'm, I'm not a certified kind of person. I'm like a, just figure it out kind of guy in most cases, um, at least when it comes to rocks, but there are some really great resources that are out there. Um, definitely check out my books, but you know, if anyone is looking for, for more, just reach out and I'm happy to steer you in the right direction because no human has all the answers. There are, there are tens of thousands of different mineral species and they come together to form innumerable kinds of rocks. And then we have different colors and varietals of each of those. So, I mean, the possibilities are endless. And we're, we're all in this together. So I am happy to, to share my resources and point people towards more resources. Well, just so you know, everyone, the website is The Luminous Pearl, and it's P-E-A-R-L, not Knitting Pearl. Remember, this is our stone person, uh, theluminouspearl.com. And that's the same on Instagram. So be sure you're following him on there and newsletters so that you're not missing out on all the good stuff. Well, again, thank you for being available on such short notice. It is so appreciated. Um, definitely, people should check out at least Crystal Basics, which Jim is holding up right now, which has 200 gemstones inside where you can learn much more information than even the topics that we started here today. Plus, as he said, uh, he has six additional books in case this one doesn't quite get your uh, appetite satiated. Be sure to check those out wherever you buy fine books. It has been so fun hanging out with you. I always learn something amazing. I just want to thank you so much for joining us on our little podcast and um, helping us learn so much. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank All right, you. everyone. It is my pleasure. Until next week, we'll see you then. Bye, everybody. Thanks for Thanks listening. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, consider sharing it with a friend, leaving a review on iTunes and Spotify, or following Knit a Spell on Instagram. You can also subscribe to the Light from Lantern YouTube channel to enjoy full episodes of Knit a Spell and see our happy faces. You can also learn more about readings, classes, and events going on with your favorite maker of magic, James Devine, by visiting thedivinehand.com and subscribing to his newsletter. Then follow Jim's fun and interactive Instagram account at Divine Hand Gym. Keep up with Katie, the magical maker, by subscribing to her newsletter at lightfromlantern.com. You'll even receive a free knitting pattern as a thank you gift. Then follow Katie on Instagram at lightfromlantern for even more magical making tips. See you See next, next week. week.